good afternoon and good evening to our distinguished chair speakers and audiences of SNS webinars in different parts of the world. Today is the eighth session of our anniversary edition of webinars and we are again blessed with the presence of two great speakers and chairs with us. The first speaker for today is Professor Yachim Wartel from Germany. Professor Wartel is a full professor and chair of neurosurgery at the University of Saarland, Hamburg, Germany. He is the vice president, International Society of Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery. He is a member of the committee of the neuroendoscopy, WFNS, and executive board member of the World Spinal Column Society. He has received several awards and honors for his outstanding contribution towards neurosurgery. He is a noted author who has published more than 150 original peer-reviewed articles, mainly on minimally invasive surgery, and more than 22 book chapters as well. He has also been a part of more than 800 presentations in medical conferences. He is a scientific chair and reviewer for more than 20 neurosurgical journals. He is the owner of several patents for medical devices together with surgical companies. We are extremely honored to have him today with us as a speaker for our webinars. He'll be talking about advantage of endoscopy in spine surgery. The speaker for the second session of today is Professor Jun Ming Zhu from China. Professor Zhu is the professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the second affiliated hospital, Zhejiang University School of Medicine, Hangzhou, Zhejiang Province, China. He is a board member of the Neuromodulation Committee of the Chinese Medical Doctor Association and vice president of the Zhejiang Association Against Epilepsy. He is a board member of the Seventh Functional Neurosurgery Committee of the Chinese Medical Association and Hydrocephalus Task Force of the Chinese Society of Microcirculation Neurodegenerative Diseases Committee. His research works are mainly focused in the management of normal pressure hydrocephalus, intractable epilepsies, Parkinson's disease, and other movement disorders. In recent years, he has published more than 20 papers at home and abroad and participated in compilation of six professional books on modern neurosurgery and modern epilepsy. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker for our webinars. Today, he'll be talking about surgery for intractable rolandic epilepsy. The chair for the first session of today is Professor Nikolai P. Professor Nikolai is the consultant neurosurgeon and spinal surgeon at the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust, Belfast, Northern Ireland. He has a special interest in complex spine surgeries, endoscopic spine surgeries, minimally invasive spine surgery, and traumatic brain injury. He is a member of several societies, including World Spinal, Com World Spinal Column and AO Spine. He is a member of the WFNS Spine Committee as well. He is a noted author with several publications in various peer-reviewed journals. He is an invited faculty to various workshops and conferences conducted worldwide. We are extremely honored to have him as a chair for today's session of Professor Yuyashi Mortal. The chair for the second session of today is Professor Takamichi Yamamoto from Japan. Professor Yamamoto is the Executive Vice Director of the Serei Hamamatsu General Hospital, Hamamatsu Shizuoka, Japan. He did his fellowship from the New York University Langone Medical Center, USA, and is a fellow of the American Epilepsy Society and also a member of the Epilepsy Surgery Society of Japan. He is a prominent member of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Yamamoto for accepting an invitation to chair the second session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs and all the distinguished audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A special welcome to Professor Shubin from China, who is our main mentor, and we sincerely thank him for arranging Professor Jun Ming Zhu as a speaker. And a special welcome to my dear friend, Dr. Satish Kannan, who is a consultant neurosurgeon at the MGM Healthcare Chennai, India, and he is our special co-host for today. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my regular co-host for today. Welcome, Liu and Satish. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to the first chair, Professor Nikolai P. Thank you so much for the great presentation and for the opportunity to be with, uh, with you today. I actually have prepared uh, a few slides which I would like to share with you. So we're gonna to talk today about the um, advantages of the endoscopic spine surgery uh, with uh, Professor Joachim Ortel uh, from Germany, who, is, uh, who I know already for many years and he's a dear friend. Uh, so I just decided to share with you this, uh, this slide. Uh, the, uh, shortly the development of the modern spinal surgery. As you can see, uh, the complex spine surgery started uh, from, um, uh, from early, early 40s in the uh, past century, and now we have so many options which we can uh, implement. You can see that, uh, in, that in that graph, uh, there is uh, many, many options, including many for uh, the different kind of surgeries. According to company data that I got from 2019, this is just before COVID, I guess things have not changed much. Uh, now, uh, only 3% of the surgeries are performed in a minimal invasive uh, fashion worldwide. 
uh, but about 30% are performed already minimally invasively in the United uh, States. So um, shortly, I'm going to comment on the concept of surgery. What is the surgery? Surgery is performing um, a, a procedure that is deeply inside the body. So you have to create a surgical path. You have to perform the surgery and then the procedure, and then you have to go back and you have to close the normal tissues. And despite we follow the normal, the, the normal anatomical paths, uh, we uh, inevitably destroy normal functioning tissue and we leave uh, fingerprints, footprints behind. So uh, the, the, the modern drive of the surgery, any kind of surgery, and including spinal surgery, is to try to leave less footprints and less fingerprints behind us. And this is the minimal invasive surgery. So uh, it's a good definition uh, by McAfee from 2010 on what is the minimal invasive surgery. And this is a surgery that, uh, that gives you less collateral tissue damage, measurable decrease of the morbidity, faster functional recovery, and you still reach your goals. You still reach the surgery uh, goals as with the open surgery. So now I would like to pass to uh, Professor Yorki Mortel, who will tell us um, what, how is he achieving his minimal invasive goals uh, doing the uh, endoscopic? Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for the opportunity here to speak at the ACNS webinar. Um, it's a great pleasure for me because I'm uh, very uh, connect, a lot connected to, to the ACNS uh, as an organization and have men, done so many courses and events with the ACNS. So. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to be this, um, to give this presentation at the, well, it's the anniversary edition uh, for webinars of the ACNS. So the topic is benefit of endoscopy and spine surgery. And this is a very difficult topic. So um, I will show you only a very few surgical um, videos. Uh, most of this is a rather theory and uh, uh, opinion. So I, I, I hope that we have time uh, to discuss the situation later on. I have a disclosure, which is, uh, I think, unrelated to my talk today, but I hold some patents with Stoltz Company and I did consulting for some other spine companies. So we talk about HCNS webinar. So everything is worldwide now, but this is Asia. And you see this HCNS here in the, in the, um, in the uh, signature and design of the ACNS Congress uh, uh, that Asia is here and I'm from Europe. So this is my small city now. I'm originally, I was born in Hannover, but now I work in Homburg. It's not Hamburg, it's Homburg. It's very close to the French border. So and you see here that next biggest airport is Frankfurt. It's one hour with a car from Frankfurt and in between Luxembourg and France. This is our department and this is our university. It's a, quite a small state and uh, we have only one university medical faculty, one university at this state. So we treat basically all the patients and uh, well, more difficult cases which are um, for neurosurgical treatment in uh, Saarland. So minimally invasive techniques. Why should we use the endoscope? What are the peculiarities to use the endoscope in the spine? What is the status of evidence? And then can we perform spine endoscopy based on the status of evidence um, without any doubt? Oops. So what is MIS? Any procedure with less tissue damage or less surgical risk or both? Smaller skin incision, this is a typical Thing we discuss, so it's basically a keyhole approach. Reduced muscular damage or reduced uh, uh, damage of the uh, uh, craniotomy. Well, this is tube-based or full endoscopic. Smaller craniotomy or laminectomy, so a smaller bony removal. Uh, this depends on surgical planning and less manipulation at the target. So when we want to do less, probably we need a better imaging. And then less exposure of intact adjacent tissue, so angled optics. So you see that all these different um, aspects can be covered by the endoscopic approach. 
and Bauer and Helve coined the term of minimally invasive neurosurgery. So min not minimally invasive surgery, so minimally invasive neurosurgery for neuroendoscopy. So when you think about minimally invasive neurosurgery, you can just look up their paper from 1995. It's basically meant that you use the endoscope in neurosurgery. So theoretical advantages, key oral approach, smaller skin incision, reduced uh, trauma, uh, approach trauma, smaller laminectomy, detailed surgical planning, improved visual quality directly at the target and the look around the corner. Well, all this can be done uh, when you use the endoscope and this is not related to the spine. What are the peculiarities of the spine? So why is the spine for the endoscopic approach peculiar? Well. I will focus on degenerative indications for uh, trauma in uh, thor thor thoracic trauma. It's a little bit different, but for degenerative indications, um, well, in general, we approach the lumbar area or the cervical area, and there we have no preformed cavity. And this is a very peculiar thing for an endoscope. When you think about uh, gynecology, when you think about urology, when you think about ENT, um, even in, when you think about neurosurgery, brain surgery, endoscopy, and ventricular surgery, you always use the endoscope to maneuver within a cavity. And this is very different when you think about endoscopy in spine surgery. Usually we have no cavity, so we have to create the space. So we have to do a trauma to create space to maneuver the endoscope. Also, we have very good results with the microsurgery. So we have to compare our results with the microsurgery. And then we need sufficient decompression of neural structures. So it's not only that we want to limit the extent of the approach. So we want to harm the intact tissue as minimum as possible. We also need sufficient um, exposure to decompress the neural structures. So we have to, we discuss already, just when we think about the peculiarities of the spine, we discussed that endoscopy and spine, well, we have to make some compromise. And then if we have to treat deformity and instability, usually, well, the endoscope is of a minor importance. So theoretical advantages when you compare an approach endoscopically performed to the standard surgical technique, uh, well, then we have a small skin incision. This is a big advantage. Um, uh, if it's just two, three millimeters difference, it's not a big advantage, but if it's a difference between five centimeters and eight millimeters or something, it's a significant difference. I think more important is the reduction of the muscular trauma. You have to detach the muscle tissue for a long distance, it's different, or you go just transmuscular and you don't see anything in the um, follow-up MRI. Then we have the option to have less bone and ligament removal because we just go directly to the target area. And then because of the very high magnification of the endoscope, the endoscope gives you all the details with the much better uh, uh, imaging. Uh, we might be able to do a more focused approach. And this, with this technique, for example, not um, uh, detach the ligament and detach the, um, fat tissue from the neural tissue and uh, decrease this post-operative scarring at the dura. And then actually we have a significant patient demand. So what are the advantages? We have better cosmetics, we have less post-op pain, we have no instability, we have less failures because mini opening, mini scarring, no, no less um, uh, failed back uh, surgery. And we have uh, more cases. Well, these are the theoretical advantages because this is not what all of us experience. What are the peculiarities? Well, there's a vivid controversial discussion. Should we use the microscope or you, do we, should we use the endoscope? What is the difference? When do we do what? Well, there's a vivid discussion. Should we use an endoscopic tube-based system with a large, a little bit larger, uh, opening more um, trauma of the axis against a full endoscopic system with small trauma, smaller trauma, but of course, more difficult manipulation at the target. And then there's an, a controversial discussion about the approach. 
Should we use a transgraminal approach or do we use an interlaminal approach? Well, when you look at the status of evidence, what is uh, evidently better or not, then you also have to have in, in, in mind that all these different pictures here, they show different endoscopic systems. So they're not, uh, there are so many different ideas and techniques how to perform an endoscopic case that it's very, very difficult to really compare one to the other. The main approaches are endoscopic interlamina and endoscopic transpyramidal. And I will only focus on those two. So I will focus when do we use the endoscope in, in my presentation, and then I will focus when do we use an interlamina approach with which technique, which endoscopic technique, and when do we use a transferamal approach with which technique. These are all the different pathologies we can approach endoscopically. So it's a, here a migrated disc, it's a severe bilateral uh, lumbar canal stenosis, for example, and here it's an exoframal or interframal disc prolapse. Um, well, the endoscopy and spine surgery had quite a difficult start in the beginning in the the end of the 90s, the beginning of the, this century, um, there was a, a lot of papers out there which showed that the um, results, the long-term results did not reach the long-term results and did not match the long-term results of uh, a microscopic approach. And this, of course, is unacceptable. If you have a worse result uh, with a specular technique, you're not able to really stay with this technique. But there was a dramatic improvement in technology and particularly obvious what this was the metric system for Medtronic. In the beginning, they had a very, very poor resolution. And now, I mean, all the, most of the systems have an HD uh, camera system. So for example, here on the picture on the right, uh, you see two videos doing the same case with a standard definition scope on the right and a high definition scope on the left. And you see that well, there's a significant more information, much sharper image uh, when you use the HD um, endoscopic technique. For example, here you can uh, appreciate the nerve, the um, nerve root. You can identify the ligament, which is here still covering the dura and uh, a much better resolution. You see here, for example, the recognition of the disc uh, um, prolapse and the taking of the disc prolapse. So um, this HD cameras were matched with rigid rod lens scopes. So then we have not only better cameras, but also better scopes. And then with this combination and uh, uh, further development of the systems, we have suitable techniques for basically all and all um, microsurgical indications for many, many indications. I think it's a little bit limited for interdural uh, tumors. And it's a little bit limited for uh, very large instrumented cases, but there's no tight selection of candidates anymore required. So nevertheless, what is the status of evidence? I will not go into detail with, with all the studies. There are a lot of studies out there, randomized studies um, um, of me mediocre quality, we have to be honest, not very few are really of good quality. And most of them just uh, compare the microscope with some endoscopic technique. Uh, there are more than 117 papers. If you go to PubMed and do a randomized study endoscopy with this microscopy uh, spine, and well, all of them, they, they share one result together. They have not a higher recurrence rate and no higher recomplication rate in the long term with the endoscopic technique than with a microscopic technique. So basically what we have reached the goal in the last 20 years is that we improve the technique so far that in the long term, we have the same results as we have with the microscope. However, there's also evidence that we have immediately post-operative less pain. There are a lot of studies addressing this and um, this is not only in regard with a, a standard microsurgical uh, uh, um, technique and the percutaneous technique. Now, this is also for the uh, tube-based techniques uh, very obvious. 
And we have, because we have less post-operative discomfort and less muscle trauma, much faster recovery. We have superior cosmetic results and we have no evidence for superior long-term results. So what does this mean for us? What does evidence mean in neurosurgery? Well, there is numerous evidence for superior short-term results of endoscopy. So this is rather soft criteria because I mean the uh, hard criteria, the tough criteria are the long-term results. And uh, what well, there is no difference in long-term results with the sonar technique and the endoscopic technique. But uh, when we have no statistical difference with respect to outcome criteria, uh, then it's no evidence. However, even the soft criteria might give evidence that we have superior results with the endoscope. Because the long term is comparable and the short term actually, we have superior results because we have less post of pain, better cosmetic results, faster recovery and less infection. So what does it mean for us? Well, I think it's um, more difficult to perform an endoscopic case successfully than in a microsurgical case. Because there's a rather high standard deviation in the results of the different surgeons. This is because of the very different techniques and the learning curve. The technique is uh, just awkward to us and very few do a lot of cases to be really trained in all the different techniques. So can we perform endoscopy and spine surgery with this status of evidence, no long-term results and rather high standard deviation? Yes, we can. But it remains our individual responsibility of the individual surgeon that he will not be in the lower part of the standard deviation. So if you do endoscopy and your case is just here, you cannot really stay with this technique. You have to go back to the standard technique. So we have to evaluate our own results. What is our long-term results? They have to be equal to the standard microscopic results. What is our complication rate with respect to permanent deficits? They have to be equal or lower than microscopy. And also there has to be obvious for us that we have benefit in soft criteria. So I think because um, there is no strong evidence supporting the endoscope, we have the obligation to really analyze our own results critically and uh, ask us for uh, each individual procedure whether we are really um, able to uh, achieve these goals. So same long-term results, less complication rate, less permanent deficits, and better soft criteria, faster recovery using the endoscope. So we have to ask ourselves, we don't, are not allowed to be here. Okay, ideally, the endoscopic spine surgeons evaluate his, case, his cases itself. And then the, the surgeon noticed that actually his uh, uh, results are for the long term, even at the very high level of this uh, significant standard deviation. So what is our own philosophy? I will not go into details with all the different techniques. There are just so many different techniques available now. But as I said, there are two basic principles. One is a tube-based system. So you have it under air. You use an endoscope um, and a tube, and you manipulate with bimanual technique. And then there's another system, it's a percutaneous system where you just have one irrigation channel, a suction channel, and one channel for, the, for one instrument. So basically this is a so-called full endoscopic thing. Also, uh, we have two different main approaches. One is interlamina or translamina, so the standard uh, from posterior, or we have a transframinal approach. And uh, I will tell you now what, what our philosophy is uh, to use the endoscope for. So we use tube-based systems for any migrated sequester, for any bone scarring or calcified pathology. So when we think we have to do more manipulation for the level F5 as one almost exclusively. And of course, if we want to implant a cage, we use um, uh, the T-lift cage, we use the tube-based system. 
The full endoscopic percutaneous system used for soft disc prolapses, particularly extraframal. I think this is an ideal indication, interframal. Uh, for the situs, and if it's a non-migrated medial disc prolapse, um, well, we can also use it. It depends on the height of the disc and on the uh, approach, whether we come then from lateral transfermal or we do it with a uh, medial uh, tube-based system. What is the technique we use for the tube-based system? It's basically the same system we use the technique for uh, any microsurgical case or prone position, and then uh, skin incision dilation of muscles, so a very focused approach directly to the target. And then uh, uh, the inter or trans lamina fenestration, localization of the dura and the nerve root, and decompression, root decompression, sequestrectomy, and evacuation of spinal disc segment if indicated. So it's a transmuscular approach paramedian skin incision directly to the target. So very different from the microsurgical approach. You might think that it's a subtle difference, but actually it's a big difference because you never expose the dura that much when you have a, a sequestered disc you want to take out. And then uh, we come from post -sleep. So transmuscular directly at the target. No detachment of muscles, no big exposure, no bony removal, no ligament removal, only minimum approach. What is a typical indication? Well, right now in, uh, in, in our hands, actually the lumbar canal stenosis is taking over. It becomes more and more patients uh, having this problem and more and more patients we undergo endoscopic decompression. One of the um, um, big changes uh, came from the various studies uh, investigating lumbar canal stenosis and the need for stabilization. Since there's evidence, there's, there's very, very weak evidence, um, actually no evidence to use um, stabilization in the uncomplicated lumbar canal stenosis case, we more and more do this endoscopic. So this is a standard technique Standard case here, you see the lateral recess on both sides is significantly narrowed. You can think here it's a level four, five, that this is actually the nerve root L5 array compressed right at the axilla. And this is the situation intraoperatively. So we come uh, uh, unilateral approach and you see we uh, usually, um, uh, first thing is to analyze and find the, the facet and then you stay just medial to the facet and with a diamond burr, we vaporize the tissue. And uh, in the midline, we start to expose the dura. First step is to expose the dura in the midline, and then go, we go from midline lateral because uh, to, to detach it slowly. Sometimes there's significant scarring in these lumbar canal stenosis cases, but um, here, in this case, a very ideal case. So this is the ipsilateral decompression on the right side. And then the contralateral decompression follows. It's actually quite easy to do the contralateral decompression with this endoscopic technique because the optics are angled, the 25 degrees angulation. And then you just need a drill. Without a drill, it's not possible to put in these small cut in the contralateral lamina. And then you do uh, detach the, um, the ligament and resect the ligament. Well, actually, I think for the lumbar canal stenosis case, in my opinion, this is the best endoscopic technique. It's, um, <clears throat> of course, there's wide exposure, but still for the muscle tissue, it's uh, a lot of muscle preservation. You have a small skin incision. <clears throat> we have very, very few cases, only one or two with the subsequent instability out of 500 cases. So it's very unlikely that you cause an instability. And um, uh, it's actually required that you really decompress the dura in a wide area. So in my opinion, this is not at all a case for a percutaneous full endoscopic system. So this is the post-op CAT scan and you see the, the amount of you see how nicely the, the, the facets are preserved. And uh, this is the skin incision. You can do this for, for 14, 15 millimeters. Another case. So this is not that obvious. Uh, I have to explain. So this is a 4-5 here, the level. 
patient has left-sided symptoms. And when you look here, you think that this is the nerve root, but then care more carefully, you see here, there's an intrafrontal disc prolapse. Here it's more magnified. You see, this is a small, but very, very unfortunate located uh, disc prolapse. And I think this, for example, is an ideal case for a percutaneous approach. So then we calculate an ideal approach. We go lateral to the midline, calculate it on the MRI or CAT scan, and then we do an ideal approach. We use the technique inside out. So we um, enter then the disc space with a uh, needle, do a discography to identify the ideal position. And then we use the Seldinger technique with, this, uh, with a wire to insert the disc, the, the endoscope with the working channel, and then we retract the endoscope from inside out. The disadvantage of this technique is of course that to some degree you might increase the perforation, but since we do this almost exclusively in perforated um, uh, sequestered discs, intra and extraframal, they all have a perforated annulus. So I think this is not a problem um, to do so. So here you see the far lateral approach, standard approach, only one instrument, so irrigation and suction channel. And the approach is to some degree difficult, but when you use this technique only in this uh, approach for intraframular, extraframular disc prolapses or for discitis, uh, it's a very, very straightforward, <coughs> sorry, fast technique. And you see easily you can use this technique to take out the, <coughs> the biggest this sequesters. Hey, you see now the exiting nerve root. Uh, when you just turn the uh, tube a little bit, you can identify the nerve root, you can identify the dura, and you can just check that everything is taken out. The radicality itself is less than with a uh, tube-based system. So you have to believe, and, and even with a tube-based system is less um, than with the microsurgical system. So, I mean, the radicality for disc space evacuation and uh, disc material removal. So you have to believe that it's ideal just to decompress the nerve tissue and then uh, not to further evacuate the disc space very thoroughly. But there are many studies out there which show that there's basically no difference if you evacuate the disc space or not. So this is a typical case Shear endoscopic take the uh, time in these uh, cases seven minutes. And this is what we took out. Skin incision. Well, we talk, we call it a single stitch procedure. So it's uh, usually six, seven millimeters. So a little bit less than with a tube based system. Um, so in my opinion, endoscopy will play a significant role in the future. Um, it will, it's difficult to really identify the ideal techniques which you use for uh, the different cases right now. And they're, they highly depend on the personal experience of the performing surgeon. And this is actually, I think um, my, my take home message. We have to, we have a lot of responsibility. We have to really um, evaluate carefully our own results. And it's possible that somebody uses a percutaneous system for distinct indications with a very, very good results. Then he has to stay with this, or she has to stay with this thing. But I think it's the individual responsibility of the performing surgeon that we really evaluate our endoscopic techniques and our endoscopic results. I'm, I'm convinced that endoscopy will play a significant role in the treatment of degenerative spine disease in the future. However, uh, since there's no evidence for superior long-term results, we have to really evaluate uh, critically our own results. And it's a little bit, well, it's a, uh, uh, we refugee side for the art of surgery, because really here we have to, we have a lot of freedom to use the different endoscopic techniques, but we also have a lot 
of responsibility really to uh, achieve perfect results. So when you carefully evaluate your own data, then I think, and you have better results, then you can proceed. So in our hands, um, we perform mainly tube-based uh, endoscopic cases in lambda canal stenosis. Well, you can argue why lambda canal stenosis. Um, well, well, lambda canal stenosis, I think, is a good indication for microsurgery as well, but um, at least in one level or in two levels, you can reduce the muscle trauma significantly. So the, the, the post-operative wound pain in these tube-based system is very solid. And it's rather challenging. You have to really, of course, have to adjust yourself. You have to learn the surgical techniques, maybe from a large tube to a small tube. But then I think lumbar canal stenosis is a very good indication for a tube-based endoscopic resection. Well, particularly since we don't think that much about instrumentation anymore, I think lumbar canal stenosis is, is now in our hands the most frequent indication for endoscopy. But I told you I'm from Saarland. We have a lot of um, uh, aging population, very old patients. So we don't have many uh, nicely migrated uh, young and healthy uh, disc in, in young and healthy patients. So then, Migrated disc, I think this is a good indication. I never really understood why percutaneous technique, as long as you expose the dura. The percutaneous technique, transfemoral technique has a distinct advantage in my opinion, that you can really enter the disc um, and, and, and do, take out the sequester and not doing any manipulation in the spinal canal. As soon as you open up the spinal canal, I think the difference between a long percutaneous in transfemoral and a short interlamina uh, midline approach is very subtle. So for migrated disc, we almost exclusively use a tube-based system because in my opinion, it's rather difficult to approach migrated disc um, in the transfemoral techniques. Medial lateral discs, you can discuss um, if they are at the disc level and they're just uh, interfemoral or just a little bit medial to interfemoral, it's probably no problem to uh, address these also with a transfemoral technique. But uh, tumors, cysts, so everything you need to manipulate a lot. So you need bimanual surgical techniques. These are the techniques we use. Uh, these are the indications we use a uh, bimanual uh, tube-based system. Then L5 as one level. Well, I, I tried several times L5 as one with a transfemoral approach and it, it did work. It did work, but not in all cases. It was not a reliable situation. And there's, it's, it's, there are very few things I hate more um, I, if I use a technique and in one third of the cases or so, I have to switch to another technique. Um, so L5 as one, we almost exclusively do now with the interlamina tube-based endoscopic technique. And then any instrumentation, it's uh, quite easy to put in a T-lit cage in, um, uh, in, in, uh, in T-lit um, fixation, or for example, a cage in the ACDF. Uh, in these situations, we use a tube-based system. Even with a tube-based system, just a few different uh, cages fit, so you really have to check before and check with a, with a, um, a system, with your own system and the company, but it's possible to use these techniques for instrumentation. So these are, in our hands, the tube-based systems, and tube-based means also interferominal, uh, interlamina uh, or translamina. So basically a posterior approach we almost do Tube base. Then transfemoral or shear endoscopic cases. Well, actually, uh, any extrafemoral disc prolapse and intrafemoral disc prolapse. Um, this side is cases we don't have to do fusion just for evacuation of the abscess, particularly if you have a psoas abscess coming with it. Um, uh, those are ideal candidates for a shear endoscopic approach. Um, then mediolateral non-migrated disc prolapse, it's a matter of debate, sometimes so, sometimes so, but anything which is migrated and the level L5 as one right now, 
we don't do with a full endoscopic transformer system anymore. I thank uh, Dr. Burkhardt, uh, who did collect most of the data. Dr. Linz, I was the vice chairman now in, in my department for uh, collecting all these data. Dr. Zenger, who is our endoscopy fellow, and Dr. Mikoli, he's uh, one of our research residents uh, for endoscopic spine from Naples. And I want to point out our endoscopy week. So we, we hope that this year we have the 10th Homburg Mirror Endoscopy Week. It's in the first week of September. It will be three modules and actually it will be combined with the International Society of Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery uh, World Congress. Uh, we hosted it in 2018 and we will do it in 2021 again because um, the uh, uh, Asian situation is, was so insecure that it could not be done in, in Asia where it was actually scheduled last year. So we um, have a hopefully a um, nice uh, workshop and conference in, um, in front of us. And if you're interested, just uh, send me an email or to here you see the email congress at uh, dot neurosurgery at UKS, so University Clinic, Sala dot EU. And then um, we will get back to you. And this, uh, with this, I thank the team of the Department of Neurosurgery for all the support. And I hope that we have a couple of questions. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Joachim. It was, uh, as usual, a uh, pleasure listening to your uh, highly educational lectures. Um, so I can see that uh, you, uh, from what I remember from before and knowing you for a while now, uh, you have initially uh, started with the tube-based systems, but I can see now you are also uh, doing uh, pure endoscopic with uh, uh, transforaminal and my question is do you always uh, prefer tube for the interlaminar uh, or you go also with the endoscope with the, the with a full endoscopic system system for the interlaminar well the, the thing is um, it's a problem of caseload I think we have um, we 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 really have not that many soft discs we cannot approach transforaminal and um, so if we have a migrated disc, we usually do it um, uh, with the uh, with a tube-based system. The, the only thing I think where we have probably significant cases would be L5S1. L5S1, there we have soft disc prolapses, which nicely could be approached with the interlaminar with the Pocatini system, but right now we don't do it. Okay. We have done I... a couple. I mean, it's not, it's not that we never have done it. We have done a couple, but... Uh, it's not like, like a routine that we automatically do this in the percutaneous technique. We just have not enough cases at this level. But this is a, a nice indication. We often have a, a large window, large fenestration, so it's easy to come into lamina, but we don't do it routinely, no. And uh, my other question is, if you have bilateral disc at L5S1, would you approach this with the endoscope? Or you still will go with the tube? Uh, L5 as one extraframal probably we would do with the with the endoscope uh, interframal we would do with the tube based system or open depending on the on the situation. It's it's even in when you have a very high riding um, uh, ilium it's sometimes even with the tube based system very difficult. Yeah, especially men uh, with uh, yeah with very very high iliac crest. Yeah, I agree yeah. with you. That's uh, getting more difficult. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I, I actually uh, like so much your tailored approach and I think this is a good uh, way. Um, I think that you having so many tools in your toolbox is uh, like uh, you, can, you can deliver well with the tubular endoscopic system, you can deliver well with the uh, full endoscopic system. So I think this is the way forward. And this is the best way a surgeon to develop uh, his uh, surgical techniques, uh, having different, as many as possible toolbox in the tool, uh, tools in the toolbox is helping you to, to tailor your approach according to the specificity of the, of the case that you're dealing with. So I think that's, that's what I'm gonna finish. And uh, it was a great lecture and thank you so much for that. There is one question I can see here. Somebody has raised hand. Uh, Ajit? Yes, uh, it's a very, very nice talk uh, on the 
probable possibilities of endoscopy a present and future and uh, my question is regarding the percutaneous endoscopic lumbar discectomy so what are the technique you use to prevent damage to the exiting nerve root because for a beginner it is always uh, in confusion when we introduce even with all the radiology everything there is a chance of in, uh, injuring the exiting root uh, so uh, how will you prevent and what exactly is the docking point of your trocar when you do a percutaneous endoscopy give intra discal or extra discal whatever maybe where uh, where are you docking it okay. i will make sure make sure that this nerve root is not punctured in the first steps of this blind procedure so i was a little bit fast maybe um the 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 first thing is you do a standard discography basically a discography and and i, I think um to do a percutaneous transfernal approach the first thing is you really have to have some experience like in in kyphoplasty percutaneous discography so all these um pain procedures i would call it uh you you are based on the radiology image that you are really you you feel at home doing the approach doing the skin incision and then puncture the different areas i think this is the first step and i think it's important that you have this experience um because the the technique itself it's not a difficult by manual technique the transform technique it's rather that you really have to know where you are and recognize the structures so the first step is the discography and this is you calculate that you are far from lateral to calculate on the on the mri and the cat scan whatever images you have I, we never actually what well, we track is usually 12 14 centimeters might sometimes 15 centimeters it depends highly on the size of the patient and um actually the, the nice thing with the endoscopic technique is that the more obese the patient is the better you can do it so it there's no thumb roll what what how far you have to go lateral but then we calculate it and then the first thing is when you do the discography you have to stay as low as possible because the nerve root is always in the foramen it's up particularly if you have a disc sequester the in the lumbar the disc the the, the disc the the disc sequester disc the probes always pushes the nerve root up so the first thing is that you really enter the disc space and as low as possible from lateral and then we do the discography and then actually we use the in, inside out so we go with the whole percutaneous system inside the disc may I, i mentioned this in the technique maybe i was a little fast about this so then you have with this technique really the or everything inside the disc and then you can you you pull back and when you pull back you notice the annulus you notice the um this uh, disc the prolapse and you just see the exiting nerve root in your way you rarely see in the beginning when you pull back just the the spinal canal mainly you're a little bit more lateral than this and then actually it's quite easy to really grasp of this this uh, the prolapse and take it out um to be honest this is never has never been our problem the risk of nerve root injury um uh, with this technique we have zero nerve root injuries in in our case materials but the problem with the transfermal technique is rather that you uh take don't take out everything they really the intraoperative feedback that you have removed everything you you don't have this in in the same way as you have it with an open exposure tube based system so usually what we do we we collect all the all the tissue and then i mean if it's a huge one sequester this in the as is in the video you're sure that this is a successful procedure but there are many procedures you cannot really take out a whole sequester then you take out some fragments and these are difficult cases when you have to finish but with this technique we we have no nerve root injury literally not i can come up to nikolai yeah i was about to- comment on this as well so yeah i i agree completely completely with you so first uh, yeah it's good to have a big uh, sequestered disc and then you're satisfied when you take the whole disc out with uh, with the scope and it's really it's really good um, satisfaction however as you said there is not always the case sometimes you you remove the the disc piece meal and i do the same thing i i collect the disc 
But uh, if I think that I have left small piece behind, I'm not overly worried because uh, there is a lot of research that uh, uh, shows, and I see that in my cases, that if you leave a small piece behind, it will it will uh, it will shrink within a couple of weeks, and it, you would if you see a, if you do a MRI scan immediately post-operative uh, endoscopic transforaminal disc, you may see some fragment behind, but if you see it in three months, you would not see uh, residuals most often. Uh, with regards of the how to how to preserve your uh, your nerve. Initially, when I started doing these uh, transforaminal endoscopies, I started with uh, local anesthesia. Uh, and this was one of the reasons because I was uh, worried about uh, injuring the nerve. And I was uh, relaying on the feedback that the patient will give me. If I obviously, if I, if I start uh, pinching the nerve, the patient will react. And uh, this was something that I was doing. But uh, Shortly after that, I have uh, decided to, to stop this because uh, it's also the psychology of the patient. The patient should be really stable to, to be possible to, uh, to tolerate you working on his back and he's just sedated. And the uh, patient will move, you have to do more x-rays, you have prolonged surgery and so on, so on. So I lately started doing this under uh, general anesthesia of, uh, as well. Uh, and lastly, if you would like to, I completely agree with you that you have to start with this pain procedure. So uh, before I start my transforaminal surgeries, I started doing my, uh, my injections. I do, uh, I inject all my patients uh, myself. If I would like to do a diagnostic transforaminal injection, for example, I do it myself. Um, one is just to uh, see the patient, how the patient reacts, and you, you, know, you create good relation with the patient. But also, initially, this was for me a good way to train my, my trajectories and my approach. I started with uh, the same trajectory that I use uh, for the If you do this, if you start the, with the injections like that, if you do 100 injections, uh, with this uh, approach, then your trajectory is not a problem and you know how to dock your needle exactly where it should be. So I suggest that if you're uh, planning to start transforaminals, start with injections. You can get a long uh, injection. And actually this is even an advantage because if you have a uh, very narrow um, foramen, uh, I, with this technique, I personally, uh, manage to get inside the foramen in 100% of the cases. Uh, while if you do short needle and if you do paravertebral approach for the transforaminals, not always you're possible to do that. So uh, this is also good for your patient and for, for your results. So before you start your endoscopies, start training your, your docking techniques and your trajectories with, uh, with spinal injections. And you will understand also not only the anatomy, you will understand also the uh, radiographic anatomy, you'll be possible to, to get the, the right pictures that you need in order to do successfully your, uh, your transforaminal cases without, without injuring nerves and without jeopardizing. Well, I think one, one important take home message is, I mean, you have to limit your experience because you need a significant caseload that you have enough experience. So my suggestion is this is why we do it. We do two techniques, we do two approaches, and that's it. Okay, so we don't switch from one endoscopic system to another, except for the, we have the spine tip and the easy go, but it doesn't matter, you know, and we don't change with join max and so on. So we just stay with one technique. And then with these two techniques, you have enough caseload. And then I think you really reduce the complication rate significant. And this is important. At the end, you need, you have to be better than microsurgery and then you can continue. So you have to be in the upper part of the standard deviation. You have to be better than average. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very exciting presentation. We'll take one single question from our special co-host, Dr. Satish Kannan, before we go into the next lecture. Professor, it was an excellent lecture. Professor, my experience with tube-based systems are very few, and I've been using microscope only. I can see the clear advantage with endoscope, uh, but I have one doubt. In these tube-based systems, probably during the initial part when you have a, a, a accidental dural tear. How do you take proceed with that? Well, a good question. Um, well, dural tear is always a difficult situation. I mean, if it's very small, 
and you 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 think um, it's not a problem, it will heal. The the risk is either in the beginning you have not done any decompression, or you think that you have a prolapse of fascicles. The, the muscle tissue, since you have transmuscular approaches and all the endoscopic techniques will help you to heal the dura. So what we do, if it's at the end of the manipulation, so you basically have decompressed everything. And for example, in the synovial cysts we do, uh, we have very, very often we have dural tears because they are so adherent to the, to the dura. Um, what we do a, a small fat graft inside the, the, the tear. Then we do tackle seal, so it's a thrombine sponge. It's a thrombine and um, gel foam uh, combination. And then another um, fat. Actually, we published this. You can look it up. I think it's European Spine Journal. It's two minutes, 40 seconds. So we not even consider this a complication. But if it's in the beginning or it's very large, then you have to switch to microsurgery. There's no way to, to really close sufficiently a big dural defect. It's a little bit different in intertecal um, tumors because there usually the, the border of the dura is preserved and there you can use small hemoclips to reconstruct. The thing I don't like with this is that you have uh, a problem, you have artifacts then on the post-op MRI. So this is why I don't like it personally, but it's possible. Right, thank you so much. Definitely incidental durotomies are a nightmare in uh, endoscopic spines procedures. I would like to sincerely thank Professor Yoaki Mortel for this wonderful lecture and Professor Nikolai P for giving his expert comments. And we had a great learning from both of you. Now, may I kindly request our second chair, Professor Takamichi Yamamoto, to take over the dice. Thank you, Roger. I'm uh, Dr. Yamamoto from Japan, and uh, it's great honor for me to chair this session. The speaker uh, is going to be uh, Dr. Jumin Zhu from China, and he's going to talk about uh, rorandic epilepsy. Rorandic epilepsy uh, has two types. One is uh, benign, and the other one is uh, malignant. The benign uh, rorandic epilepsy is uh, well known as uh, benign epilepsy in childhood uh, with uh, central temporal spike specs. But uh, we should discuss today uh, about uh, uh, malignant intractable epilepsy. The rorandic epilepsy uh, is very difficult to treat because rorandic area is, uh, is uh, eloquent then uh, it is very hard to uh, resection or even uh, multiple subopile transaction because sometimes the lesions are uh, uh, seated uh, deeply. Uh, so we, uh, th this uh, uh, rorandic epilepsy is a very challenging topic uh, in, our, in our field. <clears throat> Dr. Dr. Zhu, can you start in the lecture? Okay, good evening. Uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Jimin Zhu. I'm a functional neurosurgeon from uh, Applex Central and the Department of Neurosurgery at Zhejiang University, second affiliated hospital. Today, I will talk about the surgical treatment of intractable rolandic epilepsy. So the central composed of the pre and post central gyro and the pericentral nobile is one of the most eloquent areas of the brain. And it comes trespass to sensory motor cortex. The hand motor areas is one of the most important areas. And the omic sign is a useful way to describe and find the law on the precentral gyros, which represents the motor hand of arrows. In patients with epilepsy, the normal amenity is often distorted by the abnormal development of space occupying the lesion. Therefore, it's important to combine many kinds of 
localization techniques to minimize the risk of the misidentification of the precentral gyros. The omega sign, the lobe, like the landmark in the extra plane, the bubble shape in the sagittal plane. The central lobe have been considered to be an unsackable region because of the potential for neurological morbidity. Medical intractable seizures arising from sensory motor cortex presents the formidable challenge, particularly in the MRI negative cases. Localization of the epinevatogenic zone is very complicated, requiring the invasive monitoring and a precise brain mapping. Surgeons, patients, and their family often find it difficult to make a decision because we want to achieve the safe freedom. Meanwhile, we have to afford the risk of the potentially disabling neurological deficits. How to achieve, to achieve a balance? The worst outcome would be the failure of the seizure control together with a new permanent neurological deficit following the surgery. And that kind of condition, it's uh, referred to be double losers for both the neurosurgeon and the patient. From global epilepsy represent uh, 10 to 20% epilepsy surgery. About 30.6% of frontal lobe epilepsy is located in the Atlantic region. This is a history of Atlantic epilepsy surgery. The first case was reported in the 1869 by the Victor Herschel. A Rolantic epilepsy resection with the functional preservation. With development of the SED, a weak cranial tummy, cortical mapping, intraoperative monitoring, and other techniques, Rolantic epilepsy surgery has been gradually accepted by the neurosurgeon. Central lobe epilepsy presents with the motor and the sensory filamina. Epilepsy arising from the primary motor cortex has special semiology features, variety of type of the auras, like the feeling of the rigid, tight, uncontrollable movement of the upper lower limb and facial muscle. Usually, the patient experiences a simple partial seizure and progress to DTCS. 32% per patient, per of the patient have interictus backs in the central lobe. 22% patient have electrophysiology evidence of the seizure originating from the central lobe. So let me start with several cases. This uh, seven years right-handed uh, girl with seizure two years. Her semiology blink left limb stiff, right off limb waver, mostly during the sleep, sometimes Controlness reserve, seizure frequency four to 20 times per day. Interictal EG, spike weaver, multiple spike weaver in the C4 region. Ictal recordings, awake from sleep, blink, left up limb stiff, right hand weaver bilateral lower limb kick, onset region C4.
high resolution MRI showed the low positive findings. By the way, the treatment of uh, MRI negative refractory epilepsy, especially in the central lobe, is full of challenges. Uh, this is the MRI FDG PET fusion. It showed uh, hypermetabolism in the bottom of central circles. Compared with the PET alone, the fusion of PET and the MRI increased the diagnostic rate of the epileptic, epileptic foresight by 20%. When we made, when we designed the SEG implantation strategy, the general goal is to identify the dorsal, ventral, caudal, rostral borders of the epileptic fossa to know where to resect. So we try to surround the target area with the electrodes. This are into ictus spec, the repetitive spec in the central circles. This the electrodes corresponding to the interictus spec. Uh, there are high frequency oscillation coextensed with the spec, the ictor. Then it the evolved the, into the fast activity with a clear background separation. So this is the electrodes corresponding to the ICTO onset. This is the planned resection area. Here we see that the lesion is at the bottom of the central circles. We dissected central circles going along the central circles. See the lobe clearly. We reach the bottom. Then we remove the gray matter, the FCD, using suction until we see the white matter. The texture of FCD is also a bit harder than the normal brain tissue. During the resection, it's important to respect the vascular distributions and the subcortical white matter. Try to keep it big artery and vein intact. This is a post-operative MRI showing the extent of the resection. The pathology, focal cortical dysplasia, FCD type 2A. She got the temporal left facial paralysis and muscle strength grade three of left off limb. Functional recovery in one week. She got slight blink of the eye after surgery, and uh, with several seizure attacks in the first weeks. Now seizure free six years. This is a seven years boy. Seizure four years. Seizure frequency twenty two. 30 per day. We see thickening of green matter in the post central gyrus on T1. It overwhelms on T2. Here we see again obloma singular on the flare sequence in the central area. The PET hypermetabolism area. Again, the SEG strategy is as same as the previous case.
interictal DEG shows that interictal spike with the fast activity in the central node and the central onset from here. This is a planned resection area. So the brain surface, the blue line is central circus. Uh, this is the uh, surgical cellars. This is the anterior. The star indicated uh, some finger movement area. The arrow indicates the FCD. During the operation, we sometimes take the photos after we expose the brain and the mag it with the MRI 3D reconstruction to confirm the location uh, because the could be the arrow from the navigation system and the central area is just too important. In my opinion, this is a very good way to locate the central lobe much more accurately than the neural navigation. This is the extent of the resection, part of the post-central gyrus and a small part of the pre-central gyrus. That's MAC. This is the post-operative MRI. This uh, MRI is three months later. So the pathology FCD type 2A and the patient had the temporary left limb paralysis. Functional recovery in one month, now six free four years. This the uh, 23 red-handed girl. The frequency one to two every week. The MRI is negative. MRI and PET fielding should uh, hypermetabolism area in the post-central gyrus. So this is the SEG plane. We implant the SEG. So this is the planned resection area. According to the SEG, we plan to remove half of the post-central gyrus. This is an intraoperative photo. Mac. Uh, this is the, the after resection. So this is the sagittal cellus. And this is the posterior. And this is the precentral gyrus. This is the post-operative MRI. Stage three for four years, low neurological deficits. This is the 32 years patient with the seizure, 20 years. He had aura and a tinkling down the left side of his face, followed by the left hemifacial tracing frequency two to three per day. MRI elective, there is a hypermetabolism area in the right post-central gyrus. The interictal right central temporal sharp wave, the ictal EG shows that onset zone would not present. So this is the SEG strategy. On intraclear EEG, the spike over the face sensory cortex 
became frequently at first. Then we overwhelmed police back and followed by the background suppression with the fast return. The before the resection. Here you can see a SEG electrode. We left it there unproposed so we can use it as a reference point during the operation. This is the ECOG before the resection. We saw the rhythmic spike. After resection, so the rhythmic spike disappeared. This is the post-operative MRI three months later. Stage three, two years. No permanent neurological deficits. Actually, this is an unsuccessful case. This is a seven years boy with stage three years. Stage frequency two to 50 per day. There was an obvious thicker green matter in the right central area on the T2 frequency. High signal in the same region was showed on the flare frequency. The PET focal hypermyopathism was consistent with the abnormal area in the MRI. The plant resection area. After 3D reconstruction, the black line on the surface of the brain represents the central sacros, and the red area was plant resection region, including part of the post central gyrus and the sacro marginal gyrus. With the assistance of navigation, the exactly abnormal cerebral region was exposed. ECOG showed the rhythmic spike on this area. Based on the morphology of the constructed brain surface, we outlined the planned resection region. So we start the resection. After resection, rhythmic specs were still obvious on the post-central gyrus, uh, indicating the FCD residual. So we performed the extended resection of the post-central gyrus. The pathology FCD type 1A, no surgical complication. Stage three for just one week. After one week, the stage recurrence same as before. Post-operative MRI showed that FCD residual in the parental operculum. The FCD extends from the post-central gyrus to the posterior insula. We did not remove the FCD completely. We recommended second procedure, but the patient refused. And unfortunately, the patient is now suffering the seizure, almost the same level as before the surgery. So this is uh, 30 years ago with the seizure at the age of the six years old, left facial twitching spreading to the left upper limb with the consciousness reserve in the most time, a seizure frequency weakening. MRI showed the abnormal sick 
discrete matter in the precentral gyrus. Many seizure attacks were captured with the video EEG. Interictal spikes maximum at the FP2 and the F8. Ictal EEG is not naturalizing. However, the ictal slowing may be more rhythmic on the right. Study reconstruction imaging showed the localization of the FCD right in the precentral gyrus. The PET MRI fusion indicated that area of the hypermetabolism was limited in the precentral gyrus and the precentral circles. So this is the patient, the critical information. We performed the SEG with line electrodes in the precentral gyrus, post-central gyrus, and the frontal lobe. There was the four electrodes, electrodes targeted to the side of the FCD. We observed the interictal sharp waver in the central cortex. During the seizure, the spike in the central region getting the continuous and the frequent to slow waver could be seen all the other region. Seed onset from the electrode B, C, and the E continues the fast ripple evolved in the electrode D, E, and F. So on seed onset, the fast activity was building up on the electrodes B, C, and E. We performed the brain mapping to determine the functional area. We use SEG electrodes to conduct the radio frequency ablation. Seizure was significantly reduced. Three months later, the seizure recurrence frequency was the same as before. We can see that area of relation was not enough according to the MRI. So we can do the resection surgery. As this is a planned resection area, the yellow part. This is a image before the resection, the adhesion between the brain and the dual matter was severe. After resection, this uh, post-operative MRI complete to FCD removal was accomplished. The patient had the transient motor deficit of the left hand, long-term impairment of the fine movement of the left hand, but he got the seat free. Uh, this is the 30 years uh, man, seizure more than two years, right finger tonic, spreading to the upper limb, sometimes with the numbness of the finger, most during the sleep, frequency is three to 10 per day. There is a tumor located in the presenter gyrus, no signal on T1 and high signal T2. Cavalier reformatting image showed the cyst sonic tumor was exactly 
located the, in the precentral gyrus. The functional MRI indicates that hand motor area was located lateral to the tumor. The tumor was around by the corticospinal fibers according to the DTI. Interigital spike at T3, T5, and C3. MI 3D reconstruction shows that the brain surface, which exhibited the relationship of the precentral gyrus and the tumor clearly. So the diagnosis is easy uh, with the sort as the gangliocytoma. But the question comes how to manage the tumor, epileptic foci, and the hand motor area? How to remove the tumor totem? How to remove the epileptic foci? How to handle the seizure attack during the awake cardiac time? There's the litigation and the incision. Dural opened, notice the yellow side, represent the location of the tumor. We follow the procedure, awake cranial tumor, SEP to define the central circles, echoic recording to assist the tailor resection, cortical mapping to define the hand motor area. So the fusion of the real brain surface and the MRI reconstructed the brain surface image. Uh, after fusion. Cortical mapping, standard precaution are taken as follows. During the mapping, most important, a supply of ice semi is always available to stop the induced seizures. Mapping to define the hand motor area. is the mapping. Mapping to define the epileptogenic zone. The echo rhythmic spike was recorded from the arrow natural to tumor. Use of the echo can assist in the estimate necessary extent of the resection. At the last, we get clear the relationship uh, of the tummy. Yellow line indicates the central circus. Black arrow indicates the tumor. Blue arrow indicates the epileptogenic zone. Red arrow represents the hand motor area. So it's our surgical procedure. During the surgery, we use the continuous hand motor monitoring and ask the patient to spin the coin. If the coin falls, stop the resection. Cortex is resected in a subpeer fission with strict borders at the margin of the pretty predicted the epileptogenic zone. So we do the intraoperative MRI. We found a small piece of tumor residual. Remove the tumor residual. Resection finished. Post operative brain surface. Post operative MRI.
have a linear reformation dimension one month later. The patient had no surgical complication. He got the normal life and work. Here, we report the outcome of central lobe epilepsy surgery in our epilepsy central. Total 13 patients, 11 of them was FCD. Nine of them took a weak cranial tumor. Eight of them had the transient neurological deficits. Two of them had the permanent deficits. Sixty-one percent of patients get the angle score one and two. So, how about the outcome in the central lobe epilepsy surgery? In this paper, the seventy-two point seven percent of became the stage-free after surgery. About half of the central lobe epilepsy resection do not result in the low neurological deficits. Patients often report being satisfied despite the developing new deficits in half of them. The central lobe region is an eloquent area situated the, between the frontal and the parental lobes. We hope to achieve the complete the state of freedom. Meanwhile, we want to minimize the post-operative neurological deficits. That is why the central lobe surgery is difficult. Many neurosurgeons manage to explore the reduction of the central lobe surgical complication. Dr. Kim explored that topographic risk factor analysis of the new neurological deficits following the precentral gyrus resection. 60 of 6.7 percent experienced the neurological worsening. 51.5 percent had the transient the deficit. 15.2% had the permanent deficit. They divided the precentral gyrus to four quadrants, anterior up, anterior up, anterior low, posterior up, posterior low, four quadrants. After precentral gyrus resection, the rate of neurological deficits, anterior low quadrants was the 20%, posterior up quadrants was 100%, anterior up quadrants 60%, posterior low quadrants 62.5%, Resection of the posterior part of the precentral gyrus was the most notable risk factor for developing the post-operative neurological impairments following the precentral gyrus resection. This is the epilepsy surgery involving the sensory motor cortex. The best procedural outcome was achieved in the patient with the DNET, oligodendroglioma, and cortical dysplasia. Patients with the surgery involving the precentral gyrus and the inferior central region had better outcomes than the other group. Superior and the middle areas of the perirenaltic cortex had the higher risk of the deficits. Such outcome was associated with the 
amount of the epineptoform discharges on the E. coli, and with their proximity to reception margin. So here I would not give a summary. Intractable rolentic epilepsy can get seizure-free 70% if the epileptogenic zone located the precisely. Chronic epilepsy may induce the functional reorganization or the functional transfer. Processed at the tummy, processed epileptic foci in localization, functional mapping significantly reduced the permanent functional deficits. Interoperative multiple disability are the safety guarantee by using the navigation electrophysiological monitoring, awake cranial tummy, cortical, subcortical electro stimulation. In one word, a most central lobe epilepsy would be the seizure free, could be seizure free, and have low permanent neurological deficits by resecting the epileptogenic zone. This is my, all my talks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhu. May, may I ask you a couple of questions? Yes, please. Yeah, um, you always uh, uh, perform uh, cortical mapping by uh, depth cerebral, uh, right? Yes, uh, uh, every uh, the resection in the central lobe, uh, we use the cortical and then subcortical mapping. Yeah, but but uh, you uh, still recommend uh, uh, awake awake craniotomy. Uh, even you you uh, even you perform uh, uh, cortical mapping with the dip circle before surgery, right? Yes, because the patient have the SEG uh, implantation, so we can use the. Uh, the, the SEG to the brain mapping. Yeah, I, I think that you uh, perform SEG in, in every case. You don't use any, uh, you don't use uh, sub, sub dural grid and the scripts anymore. Mm, uh, because no. this, this patient, uh, we, we uh, implant the electrode. So uh, in the Applet Central, uh, so every patient would do the uh, brain mapping. With, with SEG? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, so most of the, uh, most of the patient had the F, 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 FCD, fo fo focal cortical dysplasia. Uh, and uh, yeah. I think so, several cases uh, had uh, uh, brain tumor. Uh, is there any other pathology do you do you experience? Um, in our case service, uh, eleven of them was uh, FCD. FCD. Well, only mm. two patients. Uh, it's a tumor. Mm. Uh, is there any questions from audience? Yeah, I will open this for discussion now. May I call my course, Dr. Liu Bunse? Thanks, uh, Raja. Thanks, Professor Zhu, for a very uh, interesting uh, topic. Uh, Professor, I see most of your patients are pediatric. May I know what is the cutoff uh, age for you to do a weight uh, cranotomy? This is my first question. My second question that if you say that during the uh, awake cranotomy uh, mean surgery, if the patient develop uh, uh, some uh, MEP, uh, re reduction in MEP, or even a patient tells that the limb are weaker, so which are your aim now? Uh, are you aiming to, uh, to resect the area, epileptogenic area, or you we, uh, uh, stop the surgery with, with that findings? Because you did show one of your case that the patient developed temporarily uh, hemiparesis. Uh, I wonder whether the patient also underwent uh, a weight cranotomy, Professor. Thank you. Oh, did that. And in all of the case series, uh, the, uh, if the patient uh, is big enough, he can, uh, in the surgery, it can, can uh, 
we, we talked that before the surgery, uh, see the patient can do that, a weak craniotomy. So eight patients, we can we do the, a weak craniotomy. Any cutoff age, uh, Professor, or you we try on uh, any any children before surgery to decide whether can can you use a uh, weight craniotomy? Because some some pediatric cases it will be difficult to use uh, a weight craniotomy uh, technique, Professor. Yeah, uh, some patient uh, is very young to they we couldn't do that uh, a weak uh, a weak craniotomy. So uh, it's, we use that. SEP, MEP, monitoring. So we do the resecting uh, surgery. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. We have Welcome. Professor Mohan Sharma with us. Professor Mohan Sharma, any comments from you? Uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed the presentation. I have no specific question, Dr. Raza. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to wind up this session for today. I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers and chairs uh, on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kaito, for their wonderful lectures and comments and supporting the ACNS webinars. A special thanks to Professor Shubin for recommending Professor Junming Zhu as well as uh, arranging a WeChat broadcast for this webinar in his country. I would like to thank both our co-hosts for today, Dr. Lubun Singh and Dr. Satish Kanan for joining me and to all the distinguished faculties who have joined us from the rest of the world. So until we all meet on next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.